these are all my teachers, alhamdulillah, Sheikh Ahmed, Sheikh Shuaib, Sheikh Hayad. These teachers are, mashallah, the most qualified teachers in Europe. How does preservation work? And in other words, how has the Quran been, been preserved? My brother and friend, Muhammad, he has a unique ability, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve him and increase him, to present topics in such a way that appeal both to the masses and those of the intellectual, academic sort of background. Take this Uyghur flag, you son of a we have our own very comfortable, very, very comfortable go-to answer when it comes to stuff like this. The Quran has been preserved, we believe, word for word, letter for letter, haraka or vowel sign for vowel sign. If it were the case that right now, at this moment, every single mushaf, meaning book or parchment wherein the, book, the Quran was um, inscribed, was to disappear right now, overnight, in every single Muslim community, you will have exactly the same book, with exactly the same letters, with exactly the same vowelings emerge and be transcribed and be recited out loud amongst every single Muslim community worldwide. That's special. The Orientalists are starting to say that there are different versions of the Quran and they give different examples of variants uh, in the text and change in the meaning. Exactly the same letters with exactly the same vowelings. Variants uh, in the text and change mm. in the meaning. Mm. In the meaning. That's special. Yeah. It's not something that's been, you know, Muslims have been trying to hide under the rug just in case people, uh, Orientalists or non-Muslims, try to attack us. Yeah. Word for word, letter for letter, haraka or vowel sign for vowel sign. So we must get the message across of how special this book is. Variants uh, in the text and change mm. in the meaning. It's not something that is normal. It's, it truly is special. So we can trace back every single thing we utter in the Quran to the blessed lips of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There is no evidence whatsoever to really confirm that the, that the Quran that you have right now, okay, came from the mouth of the Prophet. The general idea is as follows. Tawatur, or anything that is mutawatir, is that which has been transmitted from a jama'ah, from a large group of people, to a large group of people, in every level of transmission, such that it is practically impossible to belie what has been transmitted. Later on, uh, what we call the usulis, the, the scholars of usul al-fiqh, uh, principles of jurisprudence, they came up with this principle of tawatur. Did you hear that? Wonderful yeah. chains. Actually, invention of human beings. Yeah, he said the concept of tawatur was not applicable in the early stages. Only when the usulis came later on, they said, oh, let's invent this concept called tawatur. That's how it works. That's how it happened. Like 400, 500 years after they decided, yeah, let's come up with the names. We cannot leave any place. Someone to come and then tell us his the examples of different Qurans. What are we going to say? We know Quran is reliable word of Allah because he's a bunch of names who never met with one another, who never met with Muhammad, and those names all end up in history much, much later. We don't even have this chain, the Tawatur chain, in any of the early Mus'haf manuscripts. manuscripts. Yep, yep, yep. I paid lots of money for those Mus'hafs. Really, really lots of money. And now, they don't even have those names in it. The Qur'an is unlike any other book. It is not like any other book. It is very, very unique. And we get a sense of that. We're not really sure what to pin it on. But anyone who has this inside the experience, you appreciate the Qur'an, is something else. It is not, it's not from here. It is, as one scholar describes it, the breath of God on earth. So what's miraculous about it? <laughs> you have to feel it. You have to know Arabic. Okay, well, I know Arabic, but I still can't feel it. That's number one. Number two, from an academic perspective, Bifadillahi Ta'ala, we have Al-Isnad. Go through the level of Nizazari to everyone after him and how we definitely have Tawatur there and from Nizazari to those before him and how we definitely have Tawatur there. Ibn al-Jazri himself, in his book, Kitab al-Nashr fil Qara'at al-Ashr, has actually denied Tawatur as being the only way to confirm the Qur'an. 
he acknowledged the inaccuracy of his original position on the Tawatur of the canonical readings, and his revised position was that the ten canonical readings were not transmitted through Tawatur, but through single Ahad transmissions. The Qira'at are undoubtedly Mutawatur. The ten canonical readings were not transmitted through Tawatur, but through single Ahad transmissions. Fear not, we have the Arabic here as well, because we know the two Dawa gangs know Arabic apparently. Kitab al-Nashf al-Qara'at al-Ashr, volume 1, page 13, the online version. Look here at the underlined lines. He says, Here he's talking about the view that claims that the Qur'an is not confirmed except by Tawatur. Notice here the last line that I've underlined, it says, قَدْ كُنْتُ قَبْلُ أَجْنَحُ إِلَى هَذَا الْقَوْلِ ثُمَّ ظَهَرَ فَسَادُهُ I used to lean towards that view before, and then it became clear that it is incorrect, false. The view that the Qur'an has to be confirmed through Tawatur. Deception was indeed detected here and confirmed by Ibn al-Jazri himself. It is ironic that they have named their institute after Ibn al-Jazri and they have their logo in the background when he himself, Ibn al-Jazri, has refuted their very argument. So can we do a little demonstration? <laughs> we'll do this at random, okay? Okay, can you, can you choose a page? Uh, what, you choose just, no, just, you know. Because it m might look like it's pre-planned. I said random and then, you know. I don't mind whatever page it's, Well, should we get someone from the audience? Yes, no, the good-looking brother, please, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I said the good-looking brother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, any page, because then Sheikh Ahmed's going to tell us. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Every time where there's a difference, it is highlighted in the Hawamish, and this is the Hawamish in the Hawamish? margins. Because yes. the disbelievers are going to say you're trying to get away from it just by talking. You know, they're this listening is only to this right I'll start the whole day, inshallah. Yeah, inshallah. So how would Shu'ba that sound? recites, mm. as opposed to, this particular example has zero impact on the meaning, meaning it's not changing who's doing what, who, whether someone, whether the verb is passive or active, mm. because it's a noun. It's purely dialectical. Of course, any time Dawa Gangs reads an Arabic source, we suspect deception. The verse he was referring to here was Surah 5, verse 2. The word he chose to look at came in the phrase that says, seeking bounty from their Lord and his pleasure. He reassured his audience that the difference he saw does not change the meaning and does not affect who's doing what. But the word he chose was Ridwana, meaning good pleasure. The word he chose was a noun. So how would it affect who's doing what? For that, you have to go to the verb in the sentence. To go to the noun to reassure somebody that it doesn't affect the action in the sentence is at the very least stupid and at the most deceptive. The verb here in the sentence is seeking, in the Arabic, yabtagun. We went to check out the qara'at differences for that verb and the differences that we saw did indeed change the meaning and changed who's speaking to whom. Here in Majam al Qara'at by Dr. Abdul Latif al Khatib, volume 2, page 217, it says that the majority reading was Yabtarun, meaning they seek, but Hamid ibn Qais and al Araj read it as Tabtarun, you seek. It does indeed change the pronouns and who's speaking to whom. This particular example has zero impact on the meaning, meaning it's not changing who's doing what, whether the verb is passive or active, because it's a noun. It's purely dialectical. Why would the learned sheikh choose out of the sentence he read the word with the least significant difference? Why would he choose the noun and not the verb when the latter has the most significant change to the meaning? Did he on purpose ignore the word that he knew affected the meaning the most in that sentence and that he himself could see in the book that he was reading? By his own admission, the difference we discovered in the same sentence, in the same verse, the one he ignored, is significant. Since it does, by his own criteria, change the meaning and change who's speaking to whom. Deception confirmed. Take this Uyghur flag, you sons of b! Duck me!